Thank you, thank you everyone. Um, so as I said, my name's Lehman Sung. Uh, I run the data studio, Manila, which is one of the, how should I describe it? It's like one of our innovation areas within Accenture. We have Liquid Studios, which do all the fancy gizmos, toys, VR, XR, fancy stuff. And then the data studio, we do the same, but within the data space. And part of that is data science. So data science is one of the big hot topics coming up in the world. Uh, everyone wants to do it. No one really knows how to do it, but that's why we exist, to help our clients and their customers put data science into the heart of their business. So within Accenture, we call this the epic disruption. Now, what does that mean? Well, we think that in the next five to 10 years, there's going to be a huge, huge amount of disruption. We are entering the post-digital world. So everyone talks about digital, putting the customer in the center. And for the last, I don't know, five years, everyone's doing that. They're putting the customer first. Well, we're now in that stage of the world where we've done it. Everyone's either started or finishing or halfway through their digital journeys. And a lot of it depends on the company, the industry, telco, telco's leading it, insurance is catching up, retail banking's already there. But a lot of it is what's gonna happen next? Because once you've gone digital, what happens? So for us, our thinking is people will expect a much closer, a much more intimate customer service. People will expect to be treated with instant information flow. If you could think back 20 years ago, you know, it was all about overnight batches. It was all about you get a letter, and you send a letter, and then it will arrive a week later. Right now, it's all about SMS, about WhatsApp, or Viber, or Facebook Messenger. It's instant gratification. It's all about how quick that information loop will get back to the customer to give them a better and more friendly service. That is the post-digital world. Um, our thinking is that's where we need to move to, to help all the customers and clients. But what makes us epic? That's a good question. Within Accenture, we think it's these four things. We have a lot of expertise. We service, I think it's 98 out of the Fortune 100. So we know, deal with a lot of very large industries and a lot, a lot of large companies. We have the right people. We have created an innovation culture within our company. So we have people who think in the new. And we have put the customer first. We, all of our solutions try and be customer centric. Okay, let's, let's just, I'm just gonna go a little bit into what Accenture is in the Philippines, and then go into the, the rest of the story. So very quickly, at a glance. Accenture in the Philippines has been around for 30 odd years, 52,000 people, spread across 22 facilities in three cities, or three areas, I must say. Metro Manila, Cebu, Luag, up in the north. I think I pronounced that right. <laughs> I'm not from around here, as you might guess. I'm from the UK. We also have a lot of uh, global and lo local recognition. So the lady there in the middle is, leads the global <coughs> AI practice. So the Philippines is the leader in the potential for AI. And that's a really, it's a really powerful message because it shows how much innovation happens here. You know, we're not waiting for America or Europe to tell us what's happening. We're doing it here. And that's a very interesting aspect of working here for Accenture. Like I said, we try and put innovation in the heart of our, our worlds. For example, First Fridays, we run innovation workshops. What we do is we get our teams in, you know, not just the R&D guys, not just the team leads, but all of our staff can come in and think. We don't do hackathons. So some of the guys here from Accenture will know all about staying up overnight, crafting a design, creating something, and then presenting it with no sleep in the morning to five or six people who have slept. And then we'll start asking the hard questions. But this is what drives innovation. This is what makes us different. Okay, We have playhouses. Uh, this is. This is kind of like one of our studios, but it's essentially an area in every office dedicated to where you can go and think and do new things. And it's set up that way. 
So you can take a team there, get away from your desks, and collaborate and create new ideas, new things we can take to our clients to make their lives better and make their customer lives better as well. And moving away from technology quickly, we like to pride ourselves on how human and diverse we are. So as a company, we like to look after our people. You know, we, we do initiatives such as Tech for Good, where we try and create a solution which will help the planet, which will help communities. We uh, like to do training workshops. So we, we have a thing called R of Code. We go out and we try and teach code, go into the schools, teach them how to code, um, marry that with our women who code, who are here as well, women who code. So we <coughs> like to do that, help create the world of technology and make it accessible for everyone. And for ourselves as well, we, there's, being not a Filipino, I find, this, I find this strange to start with, but a couple of weeks ago, bottom right, we had Bandwidth, which is our internal Asia's Got Talent, Accenture Philippines Has Got Talent, where everyone had a band and competed. Now, I am tone deaf and I'm really bad at karaoke. So I wasn't invited. <laughs> and I can't dance, so I was doubly not invited. But the guys had a lot of fun, had a great night, lots of great experience. And that's part of, you know, not just work, but play and creating a better environment for everybody. Okay, but enough of that. So within the Philippines, like I said, 52,000 employees spread roughly equally between these two. So the two main aspects we have, one, our advanced technology center. So this is all about delivery, all about solutions, all about building the big platforms for clients. And the second one, intelligent operations. Because once you build a solution, you've got to run it as well. So part of what we offer is, a, is the ability to run a solution for a client and have it operating 24-7, 24-5, 12 by 1 if you really want. You know, run it through the night, run it through the week, run it through Christmas, maybe not through Holy Week, but who knows, whatever the client needs. All right. Now, part of the Advanced Technology Center, as I said, new solutions, delivering the big work, making the new things, is what we call Accenture Digital, which is where I belong. So digital, I always like this picture, very advanced. Digital is made up of three main parts, and I'll quickly take you through those. The first one is interactive. It's all about experiences. How do we, and this is the customer centric. How do we get customers into the heart of any solution? How do we make them feel welcome, feel valued, feel loved almost? And there's four main aspects. One is the experience, things like a website journey. We have teams that will go out there and work out what the best way of doing it is. Marketing, how do we get the, put the client at the center, the customer at the center of a solution? Content, making sure that it's relevant and targeted towards the right people, and then wrapping it all together into things like commerce sites. So, you know, everyone's now moved into the world of Shopee. You know, those are kind of online sites. eBay, if they ever ship here. You know, you buy stuff, have it delivered. You know, um, it is, it's Amazon. You know, they've got that drone solution where they'll fly, fly it to you in certain countries, not here yet, because it's very difficult here. A lot of power lines everywhere. But it's, you know, this is all, how do you make it more real and more customer-centric? How do you make the, the experience better for everyone? And so this, is, this team do a lot of that kind of work. The second team is what we call Industry X.0. I don't think they do real work, because they do a lot of toys. They're the ones who get to play with things like IoT sensors. They get to play with putting like things inside other things like drones and figuring out what they do and how to do it. They do a lot of, I really think they just play in their office. That's really what I think they do. They reinvent products, they reinvent how to use products and how companies can um, exploit that for their own use and also for customers. You know, how do you make this better for a customer? 
you know, they, they do things like embedded solutions, smart products, like I said. Uh, mobility is a good one. So they look at how do you, how do you get a customer contactable 24-7? You know, they'll work with the interactive guys to create a mobile app. You know, that's, what the, that's the kind of thing they'll do. And then last, lastly, and definitely not least, my own area, applied intelligence. So this is where data science sits. This is the area where, where we put artificial intelligence into business. Okay, and how do we do that? Well, five main areas. One, bottom left, data, big data. As we know, the world's moving into the realm of big data. Well, actually. It's moved into the realm of big data. Big data is now considered legacy. So big data 1.0, things like Hadoop, not considered legacy. We, we've got work migrating off it into the next generation. It's already old news. But from big data, you can get things like advanced analytics. So if you think back to the BI kind of world, where you have that warehouse, you flow data nightly, churn some reports, boom. We're now moving into the world of, I'm going to take that, plus add what you're posting on Facebook, what you're tweeting about, what pictures are you posting, and I can use that to create a customer 720. 360's old news, it's now 720, which is not just what a company knows about a customer, but the rest of the wider network knows about a customer. And I'm going to use that to drive business decisions. Okay, part of that will be through artificial intelligence because you're not getting so much data, you need to be able to figure out what to do with it. You know, we have customers come to us and say, we've put IoT on a load, loads of other things. We don't know what to do with all this data we're getting. Quite frankly, we're just getting rid of it because we don't know what to do. And it's my team's job to go and figure that out. And once you figure it out, so as data scientists, that's what you do. You figure out things, figure out the knowledge, figure out the value, but then you have to productionize it. And that's when we put it into business intelligence and through visualization, because there's so much data now, you need to have an easy way to understand what it is. You know, the old days of having an Excel spreadsheet, rows, columns, numbers, lots of numbers, even more numbers, lots of rows, even more ones, that grew too big to be handled. So now we've got to get in the world of making data accessible by decision makers. And most of the time that's in a dashboard, something that can be reflective of real time updates, can be easily understood, dials, graphs, pictures, that kind of stuff. So where is data going? Well, we have a concept we've called data in the new. By 2025, there's going to be 180 zettabytes of data. Now, I don't know what a zettabyte is, but I've been told there's 21 zeros, which would be stretching way off that page, <laughs> right? That's a lot of data. 40% in the cloud. So on-premise database data stores aren't able to stretch to handle this amount of data. So you've got to go to the big cloud providers, the Amazons, the Googles, Azures of the world. Alibaba if you're in, in China. Budgets for IT are growing, more and more are being allocated, and data is now becoming of importance to our customers. They've noticed that you know, they need to treat it as a resource, not just as a byproduct. So a lot of them are creating chief data officers. They're creating an enterprise data office to handle their data. It's no longer sitting Oh, half under the operating officer, half under the information officer, a little bit under the marketing officer. They now bring it all together into one place and treat it as an enterprise function. That's how important it's becoming. You know, have you guys heard of uh, the fine companies? Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. They're all data companies. Yeah, none of them really do products. What does Facebook have apart from my likes and my pictures, it's all data. None of it is a tangible asset, but they're one of the wealthiest companies in the world. That's how important data is. And also, 
How important is data when you don't know about it? What we call dark data at the bottom. So this is the data you don't know about. Unverified, untrusted, but there might be value in there. Okay, there might be data that holds key information about your business, how it's performing, but you didn't know about it. The example we always use is a very, very large American airline had their seat allocation planning based on 10-year-old data. And if you think about flying, how much has flying changed over the years? If you're using data from 10 years ago, I mean, where would PAL have been flying 10 years ago? Probably half of where they're flying now. You know, they're doing that direct flight to LA, which is one of the world's longest flights. They're doing the direct flight to London, which I can tell you is a very, very long flight. And the seats are very uncomfortable for someone my size. <laughs> if you ever sat beside me on a plane, I am sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Unless my boss lets me fly business. <laughs> the uh, data supply chains, how, how timely is your data? So like I said, the older world was all about batch nightly updates. Now it's all about instant flow of data. So you can make a decision straight away. If I tweet, I am not happy with the microphone I'm holding in my hand, I would expect someone to run out here and give me a new one. I could try that, it probably won't work. <laughs> no, they probably will. But um, you know, this is the kind of thing which is of importance to companies these days. And this is the kind of thing that you have to look after. And possibly the absolutely most important one, the last one. Data management, data governance. So this has always been viewed upon as, oh, it's a really nice thing to have. But you know, we're, we've got, we're creating enough value, it's okay. But you're, as you're seeing with European GDPR law, data regulation, coming here to the Philippines as well, there's a new data regulation law. Once companies stop looking after data, they will start taking very, very large fines. And that will affect at all companies. No one wants to be fined. No one wants to be fined a lot of money. So governance, protecting data, controlling access, all are extremely important. Okay, so that's the background. Now within the applied intelligence world, we also look after data science. And we do use Python in it. So let's talk a wee bit about that. Data science using Python. This is one of my absolute favorite quotes. Torture the data and it will confess to anything. And the data scientist there probably won't like me saying this, but it's true. You take the data, you squeeze it, you twist it, you manipulate it, and it will tell you what you want to know. It may tell you what you didn't want to know as well, because data does that. It doesn't lie. The context is important, but data itself, it won't lie. Okay, and you know, part of the job of the team leaders is to take bad news up to the bosses, and that's the job I, I really don't like. But it's, you know, it's part of the work job. So let's just look at how, how do we use Python? Let's see how we use it in a very, very typical use case. Okay, let's say we, we have some data sources. Let's say we bring it in and store it somewhere. We do some analysis, and we have some outputs. And where can we use Python for this? Pretty much everywhere. You can use it to get data from a source, be it just linking it normally to a relational database, or scraping a website. I think the demo out there shows a bit of this. You can use it to analyze. You know, it's one of the main languages. I'm not going to get involved in the R versus Python thing here because I, I don't want to separate the room. But it's, it can be used for analysis, for deep analysis. It can use for number analysis. It might not be naturally as good as R, as, as R for this, but you can twist it because it's a very, very pliant language. It's very manipulable, extensible, that's a word. And you can use it to output reports because a lot of the web is built on Python. Yeah? So you could create a custom reporting framework using it. You can apply it pretty much everywhere. So let's go through that. 
It's multi-barrow drive. You can use it in pretty much any way you want. Uh, you know, if you think about, oh, I'm going to show my age here. If you think about <clears throat> time ago, several years, Java was the next big thing because you could use it for anything. Before that, C++, you could use it for anything. Python, pretty much the same. One of the differences is, though, Python is very accessible. It's intuitive to learn. So <laughs> anyone who knows uh, Java knows that there's certain things in it which can be really annoying. Right? Anyone who knows C++ knows that there's a lot of things which are so annoying, really, really annoying. And that's just my experience. I know, I know some of you guys might love it, and I know it runs very, very quickly. There's things it's very good for. But it, it was a very painful time when I coded in it. Python's also uh, open source. Um, you know, you look at me. I'm here from Accenture. We're a big company, da, da, da. Open source is extremely important because we have a lot of people who don't want to get tied in to a certain language, to a certain company, to a certain commercial aspect. So a lot of companies will come to us and ask us for open source. Look at how successful Hadoop has been. It's an open source technology. Yeah? But you can take it and you can apply it. And you know it's going to be supported because of the community. Open source creates a very strong sense of community, which I really like personally because it means I can go online, ask questions, and someone will answer. Actually, about 20 people will answer, and then in the comments, they'll start arguing. But then you can see the reasoning, which is always good. You know? Um, as part of that, it's also got libraries. Now, libraries are one of the really big things. You know, all the work that you guys do to create these libraries can be shared so that you can use that as an accelerator. You don't need to start from scratch. You don't need to worry about doing it yourself. And let's look at a couple of examples, a couple of real, real world. Oh, I forgot that one, stack agnostic. So you can deploy Python in a lot of different places. You do, you're not restricted to one technology to put it into. You know, and this is part of being open, open source. You know, we have, I mean, going back to the big data world, You've got PySpark. If you want to put it in a Spark framework, you can deploy it yourself in the web, all sorts of things. Let's look at a couple of real world examples. First one I want to cover is natural language processing. And the second one is location analytics, one of our newer ones. Let's start with a quick video on NLP. Hands up. Who knows NLP here? I know you know it, Jera. <laughs> Okay, let's do a quick video on NLP. Computers can now analyze and understand contextual data. In case you're curious, here's how natural language processing works at a high level. NLP algorithms can't read text like we do, but they can look for patterns, and they find these patterns by turning huge amounts of text into matrices. When analyzing text, the algorithm might first remove words that don't really offer us much value, such like a, the, is, and on. These are called stop words. Then the algorithm might split the sentences into groups of words and count how many times each group of words appears in each document and how many documents have that group of words out of all the documents being analyzed. Without knowing anything at all about the text, the algorithm can then tell how often a given word or phrase appears in a given document and how many documents contain that phrase out of all of the documents. So tokens that appear lots of times in lots of documents may not mean much, but tokens that appear frequently in only a few documents tell us that something is going on. Okay. Oh, okay. So natural language processing. Understanding what a, a document is saying without having a human read it, comprehend it, hand it, write notes which, you know, was the old way of doing things. So how, how does Python fit into this? Well, as you can see here, the architecture we used is pretty much all Python. So we had storage of the documents themselves. So these things don't exist 
as a database. They exist as document files, usually in some kind of uh, unstructured data store, such as AWS's S3. You take it and you put it through a bunch of Python libraries, one of the libraries I mentioned already, and that will parse the text, hopefully understand it. You know, there'll be a model there to say what, what words mean what. And this is like one of the very common uses. Uh, we have libraries already for it. And then you take that kind of the parse text and you put it into your transformation layer. And this is whenever you start kind of creating the, the understanding. Because text is just a bunch of words. But when you put it into context, then you have understanding. So th at this point, you start understanding what is on in these documents. And from there, you can drive business value by outputting it. In this scenario, we were, our job was to go in and actually get a library, take a library and figure out what's inside the library so that we could do knowledge transfer within, a, within one of our clients. So th the client had, I think it's 7,000 documents <laughs> you know, as printed paper, old school old school printed paper. And our job was go in, catalog it, figure out what was inside, figure out wh where things were repeated, and then create an output. In this case, to the web, using Angular. But, you know, that's, those bits are the changeable bits. The middle bit is where all the good stuff happens, using Python libraries. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna drain it all, but Pandas, the old one, the granddaddy of it all. Oh my God, that. <laughs> All right, so that's NLP and how, a, a use case, a real world use case. The next one I want to go through is, um, is location analytics. So in here, we were working for a large transportation hub. Oh, that's bad. Oh, it's very dark. Must tweak it next time. So the whole idea here is when you visit somewhere, let's say, you're at SM Mega Mall, which is quite big. You go into Mega Mall, you sign up for that Wi-Fi they have, you connect, and they can start tracking you. So they start knowing where you are within Mega Mall. Okay, five floors plus lower ground, six floors, and ignoring the car parks, various shops, they can see where you go. So for me, they would see that I, I'm at McDonald's for 20 minutes, then I move to KFC, and then I move to the, the yogurty place, the charcoal yogurt place, because I quite like that. Okay, they can see how long I spend there. I say McDonald's for 20 minutes, I meant 40. I went, went to KFC for a snack, another 40, and then dessert. Okay, and then they'll see that I was there yesterday, and today, and tomorrow, and the day after, always going to the same places. So what's that allow them to do? They allow, they allow them to identify customer types. So, for example, Julia. Well, we know Julia is from Ireland, because when you sign in, you can collect that information. You might not be able to. You might just know her by a, a phone number, say. A lot of places, that's the identifier. Right, so, this is all historic, and you can use data science to predict. So, I know that Julia is going to come twice a year. She hasn't arrived. She's only been once, and it's September. I know there's a good chance she's coming again soon, so I can start using that to push campaign. Julia, do you want to come to Mega Mall and buy a new Samsung S10, which was announced last week? Looks good. Looks way too expensive, though. Or, Ola, you're here all the time. Do you want a smaller discount on the Sunglass Hut or Sunny's Cafe on level three? But there's a new thing called customer genome where we start to figure out why they're coming, the purpose of the visit. So it's, it's quite interesting. It's all about understanding the mindset, not just using historical data, but also the kind of person you are and the kind of visit you are. So if, is Judy here on a shopping spree for technology or just passing through? Is Olaf here to buy more sunglasses? Yes, he is. Why is he doing that? What brands? What kind of person is he? That's, that's for next year. So let me quickly take you through how to do this. Once again, you can see a lot of Amazon, a lot of Python sitting on Amazon. So because it's location, it's much more real time than the last example. 
you know, we take a Wi-Fi log of where you are. If in this room there's two Wi-Fi beacons, one on each side, it would be tracking me walking between the two. <laughs> Probably every couple of seconds, uh, he's here, no, he's here, no, he's here. Because for location analytics, it's important to know where people are to a relatively short time frame. Okay? You know, you're going to bring in a uh, beacon log and the map. The map's a good one because it needs to be updated a lot less frequently because you know roughly the layout in Mega Mall. You know, the shops don't change that quickly, but it's the basis, the foundation of where to put people, the pins on the map, that like Google. And then for the analytics and insights, you have to work out, you know, where they are, what they're doing, where they're lingering. Are you at a shop? Are you sat outside the shop waiting for your girlfriend? No, I'm just joking. I'll be inside the shop waiting. Are you kind of at a eating? Um, once you get all this, you can start getting to know your customer a little bit more intimately. And that's how you can do the next level of marketing, the next level of campaigning. Once you get to know someone better, you can sell it to them better. Okay? There's a there's a concept which Accenture launched this year about um, market segment, customer segmentation, which you know, I, think, I presume most of you know about how you put your customer into buckets. Well, there's a concept of a segment of one because each person is individual. And with all the data you should get these days, you should know enough about them to segment everybody in their bucket of one, exactly what they want. Now, that is huge data. I think it goes beyond big data. I think it's into huge data. But it's really exciting because with the modern technology, modern frameworks, modern abilities that languages like Python give us, we can do that, I think. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that sometime this year, we'll probably have that in a project. And I'll be really interested to see how we do it. I'm just going to leave you with a, with a quote here from... Paul Doherty. So he is Accenture's overall CTO. So he is um, probably the second, third highest guy in the entire company. You can go to a platform such as Google's Vision API, available to anyone who knows a little bit of Python. That's all you need to know. Use it for image recognition, image data recognition through its API, and create capabilities for your business. So this is democratization of AI. So what this means is anyone who knows a little bit of Python can create that kind of solution for your company. That's how powerful it is. Okay? So it's, you know, a lot of people will tell you Python is just another language. It's not just another language. It's a language which allows you to do things like that. Because the frameworks you need are out there. Technology is now being spread. Technology is now being made available to everyone. Open APIs, a lot of companies are offering them. And with that, you can create solutions, very, very powerful solutions with just a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of expertise in a language like Python. OK. Ah, oh, that's the end. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you so much. So the floor is open for any closing. So you can go near to the mic. Anyone who would like, yes, please. Uh, thank you for such an interesting question. I, I, I watched that recently. Um, so my background is quite varied. Right? Like I said, I'm quite old. So when I did my undergraduate, I did it in zoology, which is biology without plants, because I didn't like the poor plant thing. But I studied zoology. Um, one of the things I did in it was build a virtual field trip. And this is in, uh, what was it, 
Adobe Author Wear. It's a click and drag interface. It's really easy, and you just throw pictures in hotspots. It was awesome. And from there, I became interested in IT, um, converted to doing IT, and then just got into got into consulting, IT consultancy back in the day, and it became very. It just became one of those things that I got into. So randomly, I started off as a Java developer. I didn't like data at all. I really started in Java. I wanted to build websites. I wanted to build funky new stuff, interactive stuff. And then, for whatever reason, fell into data. I never fell out of it. So I've done a lot of SQL, a lot of Oracle, lots and lots of Oracle. Most of my background is there. And then transitioned into Hadoop. And here I am. <laughs> Thank you. That's a really good question. And you can see I'm playing for time here because I'm still thinking about it. Why did you have to pick the hard question first? <laughs> no, seriously. The, I think the biggest quality a data scientist needs is curiosity. You've got to be able to question why things are what they are. Because you need to be able to look at a set of data, you need to look at trending and you go why is that happening the way it is and then dig into it just scratch it you know data scientists need to be very itchy they always need to scratch away at the surface and uncover and then when you get down another level you scratch again uncover again so it's all about curiosity but to answer your question i would say there's two things and you know there'll, there'll be a lot of different opinions on this but i think Going into industry is good. Going to work is good because data scientists need to learn about the industries they work in. That's how you, you get those insights. Learning the technology is one thing, but you've got to learn about the insights, learn about the, techno, uh, about the business so you can add value to it. And joining a company is great for that. Joining a, a company like Accenture, where they'll send you many different projects, will also help you with it. <laughs> I'm joking, but we will. Um, but so if you can see a company and how it works, you get to understand it and apply the things you've already learned in your formal education and the things you will learn when you're working. So, you know, learning doesn't stop when you, when you start a job. You do training, formal training, informal training, on the job training. All of that will teach you more and more and more. And that's how you become a data scientist. You were very, very correct. Data scientists never, of today, never did a data science course because it didn't exist. They were just people who were curious about how business works and they dug in and scratched and got deeper and applied their knowledge and their technology and became data scientists. So I think that's how I think the future will be. Learn, learn the technology, learn the business, combine the two to find the value. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, how should I answer this? <laughs> no, I, no, I mean, okay, I'll, I'll give, I'm not going to go into details here, but what we try and do is to get, 
get people working where they want to work and things they want to work in. That will be interesting. Um, you know, we try and understand our staff and see what they would like to do. You know, as I said earlier, we have a true, truly human. So we try, you know, we're not just numbers. I don't know my staff ID anymore, but we're not just numbers. We try and understand what makes each of us tick and make sure that we're doing the work we need to do. Okay? So it's, it's very much being human, treating each other respectfully, and trying to, from that, keep, keep you where you want to be. And if that place is an Accenture, great. Thank you. Oh, that's a giddy. So, data in the cloud is a very relevant uh, use case right now. A lot of companies are moving data into the cloud, and security is always one of the big questions. So, I would say, first of all, you need to know your data. So, what data has to be protected? And that's by law, by internal policy, and other factors like that. And by law, as I mentioned already, things like GDPR, which you know, most people look at it and say, oh, it's a European thing. But it actually applies to anyone who does business with Europe. So I'm European. I'm covered by it until Brexit happens, in which case I don't know what's going to happen. But anyone who does business with a European company has to think about these things. So anyone I, who has my details, I can ask, what do you got on me? And they have to be able to respond. So I could go to uh, PAL, I could go to Globe, I could go to Smart and say, what do you have on me? And they must be able to tell me what they have. Okay, so that's one aspect. If it's data is on the cloud, they also have to show that it's protected. Okay, so that's a very important thing. And a lot of the large cloud providers do talk up their security. So um, Azure is probably the biggest talker of this because they were certified by the U.S. government. They are probably you know, one of the most secure organizations in the world. You, know, you can't deny that. So they will talk up their security. They will talk up their physical security, their software security, firewalls, etc. Um, for a company thinking about moving the cloud, they have to look at all of that, all of that together, and say. Is that good enough for the data I want to put there? And if it isn't, you then have to architect a solution where the data that can go there can go there, and the data which can't go there is elsewhere, on your own premises, under your own lock and key, with very limited uh, uh, access to it. Okay, a lot of the cloud technologies also in, uh, allow you to control the access to that data. Who logged in? Who saw what? When did they see it? When did they copy anything? And also, stop them from copying stuff. So there are a lot of tools there, but for every enterprise, you have to look at it and see if it suits your purpose, and what you need, what you can get, does it all mesh together. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So close to the karaoke session. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. Um, that quote I just had up from Paul Doherty, our CTO, there's another bit later on where he talks about data, because data is used in data science for training algorithms. It's, every time 
we have a data science project. Our data scientists come to us and say, have you got data? How much of it? Can we have a look? That, that's the first question. Aren't, aren't, aren't they? Mm -hmm. That's one of, our, one of our girls. But large companies have that advantage. But one of the aspects of data science is what the company knows about you is one thing. What the rest of the internet knows about you is also one thing. So everyone can access that bigger picture. What are you tweeting? What are you posting on Facebook? What, what uh, Google searches do you have, if you want to go into that? Yeah? So you can learn a lot about customers outside of the information a, uh, a company holds. For example, like you said, products, distribution. There's a demo out there, just through this door, one of our Accenture demos, you should visit the booth, it's a very good demo, where we talk about using predictive analytics for selling toys. Now, historically, bad word, in the past, the way it was done was the historical sales. I sold X amount last year, this time I will sell 5% more this year because I'm doing more campaigning. But then you, if you start looking at other factors, you start looking at, what's the population? Has it grown? What's the CPI? Has that changed? What's the sentiment analysis? Are the reviews on Amazon good or bad? That's when it starts getting interesting. So, you know, if you have, say, toys tied to a movie franchise and the movie bonds, the toys won't sell well. So sentiment analysis is very important then. Because you're going to go, oh, historically, when I do a movie and I do a toy, it does really well. But if the movie bombs, you know, the, the sentiment will be, will be much lower because two unrelated things have impacted it. So that's where data science can help production. Uh, fuels, same thing. It's like, you know, what, fuels are things like, uh, what's the sentiment against uh, oil and gas? There's all, you know, it flares up. People don't like oil and gas sometimes. If that happens, well, how is that, how is that going to affect my bottom line? Am I going to sell more? Is there going to be a sudden solar energy revolution where I'm selling a lot of my products? If that happens, I need to know about it because it will affect my current pipeline of uh, sales. So those are the kind of places where data science can help uncover trends and predict what might happen.